Hello. Welcome to Denton's Tales of the Viking Age. Is Christianity actually pagan? Now, that's an intriguing question in itself, I should think. And given the interactions between the Old Norse, who were pagan, and Christianity in various ways, be it raiding or settlement, attempts at conversion, and so on, quite often violent uh, interaction based on religious differences, it is a question very relevant to the Viking Age, which is why I'd like to talk about it here. So, is Christianity actually pagan? Well, yes it is, to a considerable extent. You could say it existed before it existed, and that's a fact. Now, at first sight, I'm sure it would seem there could be nothing more dissimilar, nothing more totally opposite than paganism and Christianity. But that is not the case. See, Christianity, Christianity is actually far older than most people believe, centuries older, in fact, because many of its traditions and practices did not start with Jesus himself. No, those traditions and practices date from long before the first century AD, being used later by the followers of Jesus to help further his teachings. It, it is full of borrowed and adapted paganism, those adaptations helping to make it what it is, a faith that drew heavily on what had gone before, being actually in many cases simply a, a version of practices and ideas, some of which has, as I've said, existed for centuries. And the, the use of previous practices and beliefs shows that the early Christians accepted them as legitimate. Oh, they would not have incorporated them into the new faith. You know, you only borrow ideas from other faiths if you yourself accept them as true, as clearly was the case in the early years of Christianity, when what had been pagan ideas had been seen as acceptable enough to be brought into the new faith. In other words, early Christians were thinking the same way. Those, those ideas did not derive from the Jewish tradition. The Jewish faith was not pagan, and they were found among other peoples of the Middle East and elsewhere. And later on, the church quite intentionally used pagan practices and adapted pagan feast days to help with the conversion of those same pagans. And some of these adaptations then became part of the established faith, while others were dropped once they had accomplished their intended purpose. And I must stress, I am not criticizing any particular faith. I respect all faiths and those who sincerely follow them. And I treat them as I would wish them to treat me, with respect, understanding, and a desire to learn about things, not just condemn something out of hand because either they don't like it or they don't want to try to understand it. And I'm simply explaining how certain things came to be. These are facts. I'm not saying anything is right, nor am I saying anything is wrong. I am simply presenting historical fact. And you can't really argue with fact. So, in this video... I would like to talk about the close relationship, however unlikely it might at first seem, between paganism and Christianity, both in the overall context and later on as it relates specifically to the Old Norse and the Viking Age. How they are total opposites in many ways and yet surprisingly intertwined in others. Christianity being far more pagan than its followers realize. In fact, you know, it may surprise or even shock a lot of people that Christianity is full of rehashed paganism, as we shall see. Now, you may say, well, how can that be possible? The, the two faiths are totally irreconcilable. Well, yes it is, and no, they're not. That doesn't alter the status of Christianity, of course. It's still the same faith it always was, but its roots were already established long before the first century A.D., overlaid later with new interpretations and new ceremonies, but the basic beliefs go back often many centuries before the birth of Jesus. The analogy I like to use would be that you have a house built of stone, but you prefer the look of bricks. You think a nice red brick is much nicer than the, the grey old stone. So you face the building with bricks. You now have a house that appears to be made of bricks. You consider it as a brick house. Everyone else sees it as a brick house. But in reality, it is still made of stone. The bricks are simply a veneer placed in front. 
It may look like a brick house. You may call it a brick house, and hundreds of years later, perhaps thousands of years later, people may still be calling it a brick house. Say how much better that lovely brick is than those awful old stone houses they had centuries ago. But it is still a stone house. To start with, you know, we, we must define exactly what we're talking about. Christianity, paganism. You know, okay, that, that's obvious, but there's a bit more to it, uh, a bit more to it than that. Christianity is pretty obvious, I suppose. It's easy to define. Now, there are, of course, many variations of it. Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Coptic, Anglican, hundreds of small Protestant sects. But while they often vary considerably as to doctrinal interpretation and ceremony, they are all united by one common factor, something they all believe in, well, albeit in differing ways. Indeed, they have actually fought wars over the correct way to believe it. But they all believe in the teachings of Jesus Christ. So, regardless of denomination, we can refer to them with the overall blanket term Christians. Now, pagans are another matter. Pagans, or you can call them heathens, the, the two words are interchangeable, they mean pretty much the same thing. They are the total opposite. They are not bound by one belief in various forms. They never were. Pagans have followed a multitude of differing beliefs, and those beliefs have come in many forms across the centuries. Some worshipping divine entities seen in human form, others worshipping the sun or having nature spirits of various kinds, like the, the Landvatur or the Huldefolk in uh, Iceland. There were divine animals, even part animal, part human deities, like the gods of Egypt, for example. Pagan beliefs encompassed a wide and amazingly diverse spectrum. The only thing that can be said to define pagans as an overall group, either in the past or today, is the fact that they do not follow any version of the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. And by definition, any belief that does not follow one of those three faiths is pagan. Hindu, Buddhist, Shinto, devotees of the gods of Osgarda or of Mount Olympus, every belief that is not Abrahamic, ancient and modern, is pagan. I'm sure there are many who don't realize that. And lots of Hindus or Buddhists or other faiths would say, well, I'm not a pagan. I don't do that sort of thing. I am not pagan. Well, yes. Yes, you are. Being pagan, you see, doesn't mean you have to sacrifice goats. Nor do you have to dance naked, uh, naked in sacred groves at midnight, nor sit in a pantagram and summon demonic creatures to do your bidding. Though a lot of misinformed people seem to think that it does. Seeing pagans as something akin to the three witches from Shakespeare's Macbeth, with funny pointy hats and stirring a cauldron while dropping bits of newts and things into it. You know, I know of someone who is wearing Mjolnir, the hammer of Thor, as I do, which is pretty obvious, I suppose, and it was recognized. And a person pointed at him, and they shouted, Devil worshipper! Evil! You know, if that person actually believed that, maybe he should have kept his mouth shut. Just in case, just in case you know who was listening. Oh, yes. At one time, of course, the whole world was pagan. Well, there was no other religion. Paganism as such, in all its very many and varied forms, is the world's oldest religion. It dates back to the cave, and it was the religion of our distant ancestors, of course, for thousands of years before Abraham came along. Actually, I, I suppose it isn't really correct to define paganism as a religion as such, since that implies a, a particular set of formalized beliefs, whatever those beliefs may be. Well, paganism encompassed multitudinous beliefs over the centuries, many of them lacking the rigid, formalized rituals of the Abrahamic faith. And even today it is made up of many various forms that, while often completely different, can still be included under the umbrella of pagan, which is basically well, anything you believe that is not Jewish, Christian, or Islamic. It must also be borne in mind that the three Abrahamic faiths all stem from a precise location. They all had their origin in some part of the Middle East, while pagan beliefs, well, they popped up in every corner of the world. There is nowhere on earth that did not have a pagan religion of some kind at some time, and many of them still do. India, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Thailand, Bhutan, Nepal, and Japan are all examples of pagan countries which I'm sure many people don't even realize. Well, those holding pagan beliefs can be found in many nations around the world. And those numbers are growing, in fact, though their views are not always publicly expressed, and some of them due to intolerance by those in power. Religious intolerance, of course, has been a feature of the relationship between the Abrahamic faith and paganism for centuries. 
But despite that, pagan beliefs actually infiltrated Christianity almost totally. And most Christians today are probably unaware just how much of their faith actually comes from paganism. Now, that's not the case with Judaism or Islam. And there was no equivalent transfer of ideas from Christianity to paganism. But it is the pagan influence on Christianity that I would like to go into in detail. Now, having got all that preamble out of the way, pagan ideas that have come into Christianity. Now, some of them are very minor, while others are quite important. A couple actually being cornerstones of the Christian faith, which we'll come to a bit later on. And to start with, quite a small thing, rather trivial, I suppose, but an example of pagan symbolism transferred to Christianity just the same. And that is the halo, an open ring-like circle or a solid disk of golden light shown above or around the heads of saints, to show they are saints, in religious paintings and on statues. That was a pagan symbol centuries before Christ, either as a glowing disk or as lines radiating from someone's head. It's actually mentioned by Homer in the Iliad, who describes a light above the heads of warriors fighting in the Trojan War. The huge statue, known as the Colossus of Rhodes, representing the Greek sun god Helios, had some type of aura-producing device on its head, presumably a system of mirrors, and that made the statue's head shine with a brilliant golden light, as befitting the sun god, of course. And light emanating from people's heads is mentioned by the Sumerians, one passage stating that it was brilliant, visible glamour, which is exuded by gods, heroes, sometimes by kings, and also by temples of great holiness and by gods, symbols, and emblems. The symbol is found frequently across the ancient world in Hindu, Buddhist, and Greek art. One depiction of it, showing lines radiating from the head of Perseus as he kills Medusa, is found on a Greek vase dated to around 450 to 430 BC, while the halo in Christian religious art was quite late in arriving. It didn't make its appearance until the 4th century AD, and only on Jesus himself to begin with, though later on it spread to saints and other uh, very holy people. Almost all religions throughout history have used some form of fasting as a means of attaining greater spirituality, the length of the fast varying considerably, of course, and St. Basil the Great stated that the practice of fasting was as ancient as the human race. But the, the Christian 40-day fast, the Lenten fast, seen as deriving from the 40 days Jesus spent in the wilderness and its ceremonies, has exact parallels in ancient religions. The Egyptians, for example, fasted for 40 days in honor of Osiris. And according to the great 19th century German explorer Alexander von Humboldt, pagans in Mexico had an ancient tradition that went back to the Aztecs, which he describes as three days after the vernal equinox began a solemn fast of 40 days in honor of the sun. Likewise, the sign of the cross rubbed on someone with ashes on Ash Wednesday, officially called the Day of Ashes, well, that, that's not confined to Christianity. And, in fact, it has no scriptural basis. It's never mentioned anywhere in the Bible, but the practice was widely used across the ancient world to symbolize the gods. And young initiates into the mysteries of Mithras, for example, had the Tau cross drawn on their foreheads. Sprinkling ashes on the head or rubbing them on the forehead was also done by the Old Norse in honor of Odin, seeking his protection. And it was done, interesting coincidence, on a Wednesday which was Odinstag in Old Norse, meaning Odin's day. Though the, the name Wednesday, of course, as we use it, is actually derived from the Anglo-Saxon Wodenstag, or Woden's day, which was their name for Odin, both the Norse and the Saxons worshipping the same god. So, the Old Norse put ash on their foreheads on a Wednesday. Christians put ash on their foreheads on a Wednesday, called, appropriately, I suppose, Ash Wednesday. Even Mr. Magoo could see the connection there, I should think. The Christian observances of Lent, though they may have been used in some places a bit earlier, didn't officially come into being until 325 AD, at the Council of Nicaea, called by the Emperor Constantine the Great, which set the approximate date for Easter and Lent, though that varies slightly from year to year, since it's a so-called movable feast. But the, the Day of Ashes itself, the, the practice of rubbing ash on the forehead, now that didn't come into being until much later still, it is thought in the 6th century, during the reign of Pope Gregory the Great, 590 to 604 AD. And it, it wasn't even made a universal church practice until the Synod of Benevento in 1091 AD. Lent is 
pagan as are its traditions. Though they're not, of course, in the form it is used by Christians, representing the desert wanderings of Jesus, but it was a pagan symbolism transferred to Christianity. That in no way reduces its significance for Christians, of course, but it does show quite clearly where the idea originated and how many things seen later as Christian were actually imported from previous beliefs or contemporary ones from other locations. Now, holy water and baptism, that seems a very Christian concept, splashing water over a baby who usually protests rather loudly about it. But the idea of water as something to cleanse, to wash away spiritual impurity, that is rooted firmly in pagan tradition for thousands of years before Christianity, both in Europe and in Asia. Water is, of course, a, a natural element, and it was seen as symbolic of cleansing both body and soul, pagans immersing themselves in sacred springs, in wells, or even in entire rivers, as John the Baptist does in the New Testament. But the, the, the practice dated far back beyond his time, long before the birth of Christ. An excellent example being the Hindi Ganga, or the Ganges River, as we call it the great sacred river of India, personified as the goddess Ganga, in which Hindus immerse themselves to wash away their sins and pay homage to their ancestors, lifting up the water in their hands and letting it fall back into the river, and taking containers of the water home with them, known as the Ganga Jal, the water of Ganga, to use in various religious ceremonies. Now those are traditions that, that go back into the mists of time. Baptism is a, a symbolic cleansing, a washing away of spiritual impurities, purification by water. And that symbolism is pagan in origin, especially the early Christian form of baptism, not just splashing water on the head, but totally immersing the person in water, either in a river or in a bath of some kind, even in an ordinary barrel filled with water. Here in Ireland, there are something like 3,000 sacred wells, most of them tracing their origin back to pre-Christian Celtic times, and drinking or bathing in their waters would give health, wisdom, even poetic inspiration. And these wells would be visited on each of the great pagan festivals. Imbolc on the 1st of February, Beltane on the 1st of May, Lunacer on the 1st of August, and San on the 1st of November. Now I've mentioned the church using pagan ideas to help with conversion. And in Ireland, early Christians deliberately constructed churches close to the pagan wells, and they would then use the water for baptism, which helped to get the pagan Irish to accept the sacrament more willingly, because it was their water, water they were already used to using in their own religious ceremonies. So its use was a link between their own pagan faith and the new faith from distant Palestine. It made the new faith seem closer to their own beliefs and thus far more acceptable. They could relate to it. Now, later the church actually stopped the practice and they used fonts which were constructed inside the churches. A similar approach was used in Denmark where early missionaries noticed how pagan holy sites would be situated in groves or trees or beside sacred wells or springs. So they built their churches as close to those same sites as they could, taking care now to get permission beforehand so as not to offend anyone nor to appear as threatening in any way. They wanted to be seen I suppose, in a way, honouring the Norse gods by worshipping beside them, rather than their actual purpose, which, of course, was to use them to draw in their followers by association, if you like. And over time, that began to work. The religious association of the particular pagan site attaching itself to the adjoining church as well. And if the church had been built in or, or near a sacred grove, well, wood from those trees would have been used in its construction to add to the pagan association with it and subtly influence the people. They also utilized the popular image of Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, since being as it is a T-shape, it could be altered slightly to make it into a cross. Now, many, many pagan sacred sites later became Christian ones, retaining their, if you like, sacredness, but in another form. Uh, an excellent example of using former pagan sites by the early church would be the Cathedral of Notre Dame de Paris, the first Christian church on that site having been the Basilica of Saint Etienne, built in the 4th century on the site of a Roman temple to Jupiter. So Christians prayed to their god, where Romans had prayed and sacrificed to Jupiter. Now, that would have angered some pagans, but it would also have helped to convert others. Mother Mary, the Holy Mother, is a very important Christian concept. The Virgin Mary and the Infant Jesus. A very nice and appealing concept, of course, but she is also very much the mother goddess of previous centuries. 
The Egyptian goddess Isis, mother of Horus, for example, many of her attributes are strikingly similar to Mary's, and her image holding the infant Horus have been seen as the forerunners of later Christian icons of Mary holding the infant Jesus. But as to the question of Mary's status as the Virgin Mother, though a very important part of Christian belief for centuries, a visitation by a divine being followed by virgin birth is not a totally Christian concept. In fact, it occurs frequently in ancient religions of the Middle East and Asia. And even the, even the concept of the sequence of Annunciation, Immaculate Conception and Virgin Birth followed by Adoration of the Child already existed in pagan belief long before Christian times. Two thousand years before Jesus, the Egyptian queen, Mutumwaya, is said to have given birth to the pharaoh Amenhotep III, while she was still a virgin. Amenhotep was a genuine historical figure, of course, who would later begin the construction of the great temple at Luxor. And on the walls of that temple is a carving representing the story of his birth. Now, this, this is a, a very interesting carving. First, it shows a god informing the Virgin Queen that she is to be a mother, the Annunciation. Then the god can the soul breath, the, the bringer of life, the Holy Spirit of the Egyptians, impregnates her by holding the ankh, the symbol of life, to her mouth. The inscription stating that the dew of his body flowed into her, the Immaculate Conception. Then is shown the birth of the God-man to be king, the virgin birth. Finally, he is shown being worshipped. And among the worshippers, interestingly enough, are an obvious group of three men who are offering him gifts, as the three magi would later be said to do for Jesus, the adoration. The parallels are striking. In fact, they are exactly the same. As they used to say in Hollywood at the start of the famous police show, Dragnet, the story you are about to see is true. Only the names have been changed. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. In another story, the Egyptian queen Amos is visited by the god Amun, who went to her in the form of Pharaoh Tutmos I. And he woke her with pleasing odors, and he held the ankh to her nose. And thus was conceived at Shepsut, in what was, of course, a virgin birth, since no sexual intercourse took place. It was more of a, a sexual sniff, you might say. Hatshepsut was, of course, a genuine historical figure, and though a woman, she became one of the greatest pharaohs of Egypt. But there are suggestions that she actually put the story of her conception around herself, to add to her already divine status of pharaoh. But that would have been easily accepted, because miraculous births are found, as I said, in many religions, from Greece, across the Middle East, and on to Asia. Even in the New World, the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl was also said to have been born to a virgin. So the concept of the virgin made pregnant by divine intervention had its roots many centuries before Christianity. St. Bridget of Ireland, one of the patron saints of Ireland, along with St. Patrick and St. Columba, as it happens, is actually pagan in origin. She was the great Celtic goddess Bridget, seen in a collective triple form, as was the other great Celtic goddess, the Morrigan. But the early church made her just one, they gave her a halo, renamed her St. Bridget, and her new Christian feast day was the same date as her old pagan feast day. But even some of the pagan rituals preserved and brought with her into Christianity, such as an everlasting flame tended by nuns instead of female druids. And also the very famous St. Bridget's Cross, a symbol of Ireland known around the world, a cross made of twisted straw, and a very popular tourist item in Ireland today. You see them in all the, all the tourist shops. But it too dated from pagan times, various ritual items having been made the same way by twisting straw, of which of course there would have been plenty lying around. Things like children's toys would also have been made in the same way. So Ireland, a very Catholic country, has a renamed pagan goddess as one of its patron saints and represented by a pagan symbol. The St. Bridget's Cross, by the way, was the symbol of Telefusieren at one time, the Irish National Broadcasting Company, using an accurate version of the old style of straw cross. And later on, when they became Radio Telefusieren, they had a stylized version of the St. Bridget's Cross, along with the letters RTE as their logo. 
Now that logo, however, is, is no longer used. They, they just have the letters RTE. Halloween, All Saints Day or All Hallows, comes from the Irish Celtic Harvest Festival called Samhain, which means the end of summer. One of four festivals that occurred during the year. The others, as I mentioned, being Imbolc, Beltane and Lunasa. And it had been an important religious date since Neolithic times, some passage graves being perfectly aligned with the sunrise on that day. Quite a feat in an age before modern surveying equipment, you know, calendars, computers and so on. And they include the well-known Mound of the Hostages on the hill of Tara, as well as one of the cairns on Shlieve the Chaliach, the Mountain of the Chaliach, the old hag of Irish folklore. But in the 8th century AD, Pope Gregory III declared it to be the festival to remember all the holy saints, and it became All Saints Day. The other traditions of Halloween as we know it today came later. Using existing pagan festivals and feast days was a good way of helping to convert people, something I've already touched on. They, they would be more accepting of something done on a day they were already used to worshipping on, especially, as in the case of Bridget, if it was similar to the previous focus of that worship. And for the same reason, churches are often built on the site of pagan temples or beside pagan holy places, such as sacred groves, hills or wells, as I, as I mentioned. So people would worship in a familiar place, one they associated with worship, like Notre Dame de Paris. So that association would hopefully gradually transfer from their old faith to the new faith, and then they could be baptized with water from their own sacred wells. It, it was a very, very clever use of, of psychology, if you like, long before Sigmund Freud thought of it. Now, we come to a very special and important belief, the Holy Trinity, which is one of the core beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church as well as many other Christian denominations and is regarded by many as being a totally Christian concept lying as it does at the very heart of Christianity but in fact it isn't. The concept of the Trinity existed more than a thousand years before Christianity. Now I've seen Christian scholars fiercely denounce those who say the concept of a divine trinity isn't Christian in origin and that it was established long before. No! No, they say, the trinity is Christian. It exists nowhere else. And that's that. The trinity is Christian. End of story. Well, sorry guys, nobody in the first centuries of Christianity, the first three centuries of it, had ever heard of that concept. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, yes, but as separate entities, not as a combined yet individual being. And the early church had problems with that. They had problems with the concept of God the Father and Jesus the Son of God. How did God have a son, since you know, there was no goddess, if, if you see what I mean. And then there was also the Holy Spirit, and who was he, and what did he do. And all this was, a, well, it was all rather confusing. And it was debated at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, but it wasn't really resolved. And it wasn't until the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, called by the Emperor Theodosius I, that the Trinitarian doctrine was finally agreed, that God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit were equal parts of a trinity, separate yet also one, which seemed to clear the matter up to everyone's satisfaction. But, but you see, the, the, the problem is that a trinity, a trinity in any, any form, is mentioned nowhere in either the Old or the New Testament. Jesus himself never mentioned it. It is not biblical scripture. It was an idea basically thought up by the council themselves to explain the rather hard-to-understand relationship between God and Jesus and the Spirit. It resolved a problem of interpretation, if you like. But early Christians had never regarded God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit in that manner. And it was only after 381 AD that it became church doctrine. But it had no scriptural basis. It wasn't in the Bible nor in the teachings of Jesus. And it only came into being more than 300 years after his death. Though the concept of a divine trinity in various forms had existed for centuries among the pagans, which the church would have been well aware of, since the, the great and much respected early Christian theologian St. Jerome of Stridon, who died in 420 AD, stated that all the ancient nations believed in the trinity. There you have it from respected theologian St. Jerome himself. And so they did, either as gods seen in unrelated trios or in a multiple form exactly like that of Christianity. The three points of the equilateral triangle had long made it a symbol for the gods. And many cultures divided their gods into groups of three, Isis, Horus and Osiris in Egypt, Ea, Enu and Enlil in Sumeria, 
while the Irish goddess is seen in a collective triple form, Bridget and the Morrigan. And triple concepts were very important to the Celts of, of Ireland and elsewhere. Birth, life, death, the sea, sky, earth, past, present, future. You know. And they express this with the so-called Trinity Knot, an ancient Celtic symbol, which was later adopted by Christians around the 4th century AD, who used it to represent, yes, the Holy Trinity, given its conjoined triple shape. But, but not just triple images or gods divided into separate groups of three, which was not quite the same three-in-one concept that the Council came up with. There were also those exactly the same as that Christian one yet separate concept, as in Babylon, where there was the depiction of a god with three heads, or in Ireland, where a carved stone head was discovered at Corlick Hill in County Cavan, dated to around the 1st or 2nd century AD, showing a triple-headed god. And the same three-headed god image is found in Slavic and in Indian art. Now, having mentioned India, in that remarkable country are the Puranas. They are ancient Indian texts that date back more than 3,000 years, containing a vast amount of knowledge on all sorts of subjects and forming the basis for much of Hindu belief. And in one of them is the following very interesting and enlightening passage in which a man calls on the Hindu trinity. Rama the creator, Vishnu the preserver, and Shiva the destroyer. A trinity that was seen as separate, yet also one. That one being the supreme divinity, called Parabrahman. The man says, O ye three lords, know that I recognize only one God. Inform me therefore, which of you is the true divinity, that I may address to him alone my adorations? The three gods Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, becoming manifest to him, replied, Learn, O devotee, there is no real distinction between us. What to you appears such is only the semblance. The single being appears under three forms by the acts of creation, preservation, and destruction. But he is one. Three separate personalities, yet all of them, Parabrahman. That is exactly the Trinity concept accepted by the Council of Constantinople only more than a thousand years before they thought of it. In fact, it's very likely that is where the Council got the idea from. It fitted their requirements perfectly. It would have been the concept they were looking for. So yes, the concept of the Holy Trinity in its specific Christian form is pagan in origin regardless of where the Council of Constantinople got the idea from. And that, of course, in no way debases the Holy Trinity. It act, you could actually say it, it could be taken as reinforcing it, since Christians are not the only ones who believe in it. So, too, do over 1,000 million Hindus around the world, almost 870 million of them residing in India, according to recent census figures. And that's rather a lot of people thinking the same way. Now... What could be more Christian than Christmas? Christmas, a celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ himself. Christian must be, uh, Christmas, I should say, must be totally, 100% Christian, right? Well, um, no. No, actually it isn't. There is only one thing about Christmas that is genuinely Christian. Jesus was born. That's it. Actually, come to think of it, no, even, even that's not true. He wasn't actually born on December the 25th. No actual date is given in the Gospels, nor are we sure even what year he was born in. Theologians seem to favor some time between 6 BC and 4 BC, and December the 25th was a date decided upon many years later by the Church, by Pope Julius I in 336 AD, who I'm sure probably said something along the lines of, Jesus Christ was born on the 25th of December because I say so, and I'm the Pope. End of, end of debate. But... Why did he pick a date in the middle of winter, you might ask, when shepherds would not have been watching their flocks by night? You know, midwinter in Palestine would have been pretty cold at night. They would not have been herding sheep or anything else out in the open, uh, waiting for an angel to come flapping down out of the sky and announce something. Well, a Roman historian named Sextus Julius Africanus had decided that Jesus was conceived on March the 25th. He also gave the same date for the creation of the world. Obviously, he really liked that date for creating things. Though in Mary's case, how he arrived at that rather intimate detail, I really have no idea, but, but he did. And nine months in Mary's womb resulted in Jesus being born on December the 25th. Yeah, 
could work, I suppose. But the real reason for that date being chosen by the Pope was actually to coincide with the pagan festival of Saturnalia, which occurred around the same time, when all work stopped. People gave each other gifts, even slaves didn't have to work. And they could often join their masters at the table and even be served by their masters. There was singing and gambling, a lot of feasting, and well, being ancient Rome, plenty of well, you know, romantic stuff as well. Now, a lot of that wouldn't go down too well with the church. So what better way to stop all that dreadful pagan carry-on than to make it Christ's birthday? I mean, you couldn't be getting drunk and fornicating and hobnobbing with your servants on, on Christ's birthday, now could you? No. So, even the date of the most Christian of all festivals is itself actually pagan. But what about all the Christmas traditions, the celebrations, the, the fun things, if you like, of Christmas? Surely, surely they must be Christian? No, no, most of them actually come from old Norse traditions that date back centuries before Jesus was born, from the Norse Yule. And you know, therein, therein lies the great irony of Pope Julius's choice of December to replace pagan festivities with the birthday of Jesus, because by using a date that coincided with the Norse Yule, he replaced pagan festivities with even more pagan festivities, albeit cloaked in a disguise of Christianity. Now, Yol was the midwinter festival that began on the winter solstice, December the 21st, and it lasted officially for three days, though it could extend to 12 days or so, from which we get the 12 days of Christmas. And it was celebrated with feasting, banquets, games, a great deal of drinking, especially drinking, singing and general merrymaking, culminating with the Yol blot, or the Yol sacrifice towards the end, when animals like goats, boars and horses would be offered to the gods and then eaten. The name's Yule, and Yule Tide, obviously, derived from the Norse word. And Christmas is known today as Yule in Iceland and the Faroe Islands, keeping its old Norse name, and as Yule in Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. Denmark. Now, I'll be, I'll be doing a video specifically about Yule and Christmas, and uh, in which I will go into detail about the various traditions associated with the, with the season and the history of them. But for now, I'll just list the main points. To start with, the Christmas wreath. Green things, and especially green things with red berries on them, are a part of many pagan cultures. They were used by the Celtic Druids in Britain and Ireland, for example. And the various forms of greenery associated with Christmas come principally from Old Norse tradition. Plants like holly, mistletoe, ivy, and various evergreens remained green during the winter, and thus they were seen as possessing a spirit magic against the dark forces of winter. So they provided both protection to the home and decorations at the same time. The tradition of the holly and the ivy also comes from those times, one being seen as a male plant and the other as female. Both have a similar dark green colour, so the two were placed together. An attractive decoration that also possessed sexual symbolism. But early Christians didn't like its evil pagan symbolism, with its connections to the various spirits of nature and its sexual connotation. I mean, you couldn't have that sort of thing going on. And they wanted the use of it banned altogether. In fact, they wanted all green things banned as evil. But the advantages of keeping such traditions and adapting them to make Christianity more palatable to pagans won out. And so that and various pagan traditions simply changed sides, you might say. Pagan and thus very bad one day, rather cynically became Christian and thus very good the next, despite being exactly the same as they were previously. Mistletoe that most romantic of all symbols of Christmas, has a very special place in Old Norse belief, since it was inadvertently responsible for the death of the beautiful god Balder, the son of Odin and Frigg, beloved by all the gods. So much so that they wished to keep him safe from harm. So Frigg called on everything in the Nine Realms to take a binding oath never to harm him. And they did. Everything save one. She overlooked the mistletoe. Loki found out about the oversight, and being Loki, used it to cause trouble. The gods were having great fun chucking things at Balder. He was impervious to anything they threw at him, but Loki got the blind god Hoder, and he gave him a length of sharpened mistletoe, and he told him to join in the fun, and he pointed Hoder in the right direction, telling him to throw the mistletoe. The mistletoe, knowing nothing, of course, about the oath, pierced Balder's heart, killing him. Frigg's tears after the death of her son became the white, pearl-like berries on the plant. But, but she forgave the plant. It was innocent of any malice. It had been used against its will. And she decreed that mistletoe would never again be used as a weapon, and that she would send a kiss to all those passing beneath it. So mistletoe came to be seen as a symbol of love and friendship, and to be regarded as something to stand under while kissing someone. 
Though that symbolism uh, of the kiss comes from Scandinavia, the plant's name actually derives from Old English. The Anglo-Saxons calling it mistletan, from mistel, which meant dung, and tan, meaning a stick or a twig. The plant is actually a parasite. It's spread by bird droppings landing on other plants that it can grow on, hence the name. I hope the romantic setting isn't spoiled for you by knowing that the plant one kisses under dropped out of a passing bird's arse, and the name literally means shit on the stick. Now, passing quickly on from that, the, the Yule Log. Now, the Yule Log also derives from Norse and North Germanic pagan tradition. When a small tree would be cut down, the entire tree being brought into the house, and one end would be put into the fire, large enough to gradually burn down over the mid-winter festivities, being pushed into the firebox a bit at a time as it burned. The Christmas tree. Now, that's surely a modern Christian idea. Well, the first Christmas trees were introduced into England quite recently, that's true enough, from Germany by Prince Albert of saxe coburg gotha husband of Queen Victoria. But originally it too was a pagan tradition of the winter solstice, both as a living decorated tree outside the house or when an evergreen tree would be brought into the home, called a yule tree. So the, the tree spirits would then come in along with it, they would inhabit the dwelling and bestow blessings on the occupants. And the trees would be decorated with things like apples and stars and little treats like cakes for the spirits. But the tree decorations changed their meaning for the Christians. Apples that once would have been seen as the youth-giving apples of the Norse goddess Idun became the fruit of the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden, and stars became symbols of God and heaven, while the trees themselves, given their generally triangular shape, became symbols of the Holy Trinity. The Christmas ham, too, is pagan, another legacy of the Old Norse, when it would have been boar meat. The Yol boar representing homage to the god Freyr, who rode on a gold-bristled boar named Gullenbristi, or Golden Bristles. While those with a special devotion to Freya's sister, Freya, might have seen it as the sow Hildesvini, battle swine, since she too rode a boar at times when she wasn't being drawn in her chariot by two cats. Another Christmas tradition that began with the Norse midwinter festivities is, believe it or not, Santa Claus himself. Yes, the big red guy, and even his reindeer. You see, Odin was closely associated with the Midwinter Festival, one name for him being the Yol Father. And at that time he would ride out from Oskada on his eight-legged horse Sleipnir, and he would travel around riding over the rooftops with his spear in his hand, visiting people in their homes and bestowing runes as gifts. His two ravens, Hugin and Munin, flying ahead to see who was good and who was bad. The 19th century idea of him drawn by eight reindeer came, of course, from the image of the eight-legged Sleipnir. Christmas carols, too, predate Christian times. Special songs were composed and sung during midwinter as petitions to the gods for a good harvest in the coming year, or to wealthy persons in the hope of receiving gifts. This was known as wassailing or yule singing. Later it became caroling, and it continued down into Christian times and ever since. There was even a Norse equivalent of milk and cookies for Santa and a carrot for Rudolph, since children would leave out their shoes, filled with straw, for Odin's horse, Sleipnir. So is the is the nothing, nothing connected with Christmas that is actually Christian? Well, yes, yes, there are. There are two things actually. Unlike the Yule log, the Christmas tree, the wreath, Santa Claus, reindeer, Christmas carols, the various decorations, the Christmas ham, even the date of Christmas itself, the Christmas turkey. Yes, the Christmas turkey can claim its place as fully and totally Christian, having nothing whatsoever to do with Yule, since. Well, you know, there weren't any turkeys in, in Scandinavia. And that great British tradition, the Christmas pudding, well, that only dates from around the 17th century. Now, another Christian concept, a very important one in ages past, probably less so today, borrowed from old Norse paganism, is hell, the place where the dead go, who are you know, not really not very nice in life in the Christian version, spelled with two L's. Though the, the Norse version, spelled with one L, well, that was decidedly better, and people did pretty much what they had done in life, in death. Now, not the concept of somewhere the dead went. There are plenty of references to that in the Bible. But the word itself, hell, that we get from Old Norse. The Old Testament uses the word shiol, which meant a grave, somewhere you put dead people, a hole in the ground, if you like. It could be translated as the underworld, the place of the dead. But in, say, the King James Bible, it is translated as hell. 
And the same in the New Testament, where Greek words like Hades or Gehenna are used, but they too become hell in translation. That is not the word used in the Bible. Jesus never used that word. The word hell is not found in either the Old or the New Testament. It comes from the Old Norse. The first use of the word hell in English actually comes from as late as 725 A.D., And it was by the Anglo-Saxons in Old English, which was either hell, spelt with one L as in Old Norse, or hella, spelt H-E-L-L-E. So, there we come to the end of this look at paganism and Christianity, two systems of belief that have been at loggerheads for centuries, despite sharing so much in common, and never seeming to realize how much they were actually part of each other. Even today, Most people don't have any idea where the tenets of the various churches that make up the Christian faith actually come from. They simply accept them as Christian, which of course they have been for centuries, rather than what they actually are for the most part, later adaptations of far more ancient beliefs. Beliefs that officially were frowned on by the church, yet formed an integral part of it. So, until next time, I shall say farewell, goodbye for now.